This begun act out, Louis must die so that the people may live. What the French Revolution should and could teach us about the global rebellions underway right now. And what serious questions and conversations we must broach in order to step onto that political stage. Plus, another look at AFRICOM and a dive into imperialism, class warfare, and African internationalism with Chairman Omali Yeshitela of the African People's Socialist Party. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is ACT OUT. Welcome to ACT OUT, I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. Louis must die so that the nation may live, wrote Maximilien Robespierre, an architect of the French Revolution. The so-called terror of the French Revolution has garnered hundreds of, if not thousands, of books, films, series, essays, and experts. It's often used as an example of what not to do, how things can really just go too far in the pursuit of freedom and justice. Alternatively, it is often held up as an example of the power of the people, not least of all women, who in many respects led the revolution, starting with their march to Versailles in 1789. It's pedestaled and condemned, more often so the latter. In comparisons to the French Revolution, the Yellow Vest movement was highlighted for its violence, despite the fact that it was the French law enforcement that broke bones and drew blood, as protesters broke windows. Similarly, right now in Chile, our contact Joaquin Hernandez in Santiago writes, The police are using rubber bullets, and they aim to the face. Children like this one, 12 years old, are not exempt from the violence. Joaquin continues, As of today, 170 persons were one-eyed. The police detain people in normal cars or trucks. The police have sexually abused and tortured. And recently, the president, Piñera, has sent bills to criminalize protest. The support of Piñera is now only 9%, but he refuses to resign. Power concedes nothing. And as corporate media glosses over the inherent and extreme violence of the state, it also glosses over the impetus for rebellion, as was the case for the Yellow Vests, the protests in Iraq, and even as far back, again, as the French Revolution. And in so doing, it makes extremists out of those literally fighting for their lives, simplifying their struggles to a single issue, a, a menial tax or fee. In reality, though, the core of this current crisis in Chile, for instance, traces back to the U.S. coup, which installed the military dictator Augusto Pinochet on September 11, 1973. In line with our imperialist Monroe doctrine, the U.S. refused to accept a democratically elected leftist government anywhere in South America. Indeed, we still do as evidenced just this week with the right-wing violence that prompted democratically elected Bolivian President Evo Morales to resign, an indigenous socialist president who has brought health care, education, housing, and indeed happiness to his majority indigenous country, including a constitution that gives nature full personhood rights. Ideas that we as U.S. residents have only dreamed of are in fact legislative realities in Bolivia. And that is not okay. That could not stand, just as democratically elected leftist President Allende could not stand in Chile. Instead, tens of thousands of Chileans had to be tortured, raped, disappeared, and murdered. This was the remedy for self-determination, the antidote for autonomy. When we look at the current protests in Chile, we cannot extricate the past from the present. We trained that military that is now torturing, raping, and disappearing once again. We helped to ensure that those who benefited from the horrors of Pinochet were not brought to justice. Put simply, the neoliberalism that was born after Pinochet's reign is born from that same sick, tormented body politic. The pain, the oppression, the thirst for justice runs deep. And yet still, when the protest first began, corporate media insisted it was about a public transportation fare hike, just like in France when media claimed it was all about this fuel tax, or indeed that the French Revolution was about bread. 
No, people do not risk their lives because a bus costs a few extra bucks. People reach the tipping point because of years of oppression, a thousand paper cuts. Years of the covert, sanitized oppression that, from afar, doesn't look like anything like a military dictatorship. It looks, well, it looks a lot like our own country. Atrocious education, lousy healthcare, no social security to speak of, subsistence living wages, unstable employment, gross income inequality, corruption, and corporate power. Indeed, one need only look to the protesters' demands to see the mirror of their pain. Again, as Joaquin noted, the main demands are the resignation of Pineda, justice regarding the killing and torture by the state a new constitution by constituent assembly, a series of social reforms like health care, education, pensions, and the deprivatization of water, copper, and other resources. These are demands that fly in the face of imperialist neoliberalism. They are rooted in autonomy and basic human rights that include the right to self-determination, ownership of our own labor, the casting off of oppression in favor of collective control and care. And that's why they're so scary. That's why Pineda seeks to criminalize dissent. That's why he's creating a team for, quote, preventative intelligence and citizens' complaints, which seek to stop demonstrations and highway pickets. That's why he's pulling together the National Security Council, or COSENA, a consulting body that is made up of the leaders of all three government branches and the four commanders-in-chief of the Armed and Order Forces. In other words, a political, military faction. Echoes of the not-so-distant Chilean past, right? Again, as Joaquin writes in the article on this new development, it is done in the name of national security and public order. The same arguments that he has already used to justify sustained repression of dissent. From this perspective, the outlook appears grim and pessimistic. But that is only one way of reading the situation. It is clear that this turn, even further rightward, with his repression agenda, is symptomatic of Sebastián Piñera's government's inability to placate the tireless will of the people to fight for their rights and demands. This will is sustained even when shot in the eye, even with the army on the streets, even after enduring random searches of civilian vehicles, and even when the army resorts to torture and sexual assault. None of this has put a dent on the people's unwavering thirst for justice and a better tomorrow. Pineda could declare a dictatorship tomorrow, and I don't doubt that this is a possibility, but he will never be able to return the population to the state of lethargy it was in before this past October. Sadly for him, one cannot roll back the wheel of history. Truly, with the forward march of oppression, the forward march of resentment and resistance march on. And when the pain becomes greater than the fear, the people cannot be placated. At a certain threshold, things are bad enough and real enough for enough people that they are willing to set aside a fragile comfort and embrace a shaky discomfort, a powerful solidarity and potential of mass mobilization and revolt. And as protests rise across the globe, a common question that I've gotten is, well, when's the time for us? Where's, where's our threshold? There are a lot of answers to that question, and part of it is that these protests are happening. People are going on strike. People are blocking pipelines and the Gestapo of ICE and Border Patrol. People are fighting back and building. But yes, these protests have not reached a mass tipping point, that point of boiling over. And much of this is thanks to the designed division of this country, a splintered nation across thousands of miles encompassing thousands of cultures and disparate lived experiences. There is no United States. It's a facade that we're programmed to believe in but have no deep connection to because, in reality, there's no depth. Our lawmakers do not live among us. They are so far removed, literally and figuratively, from our realities that they couldn't properly represent us even if they wanted to, and most often, they don't want to. Compound this divided and conquered reality with the fact that many people feel isolated and forgotten, feel that fighting back is pointless. Loneliness kills as many people as obesity in this country, and that too is by design. On the other hand, many feel that the situation just isn't 
bad enough to warrant protest, much less revolt. They're comfortable in that fragile status quo, with the oppression just good enough that the lullaby still plays. So no, we are not a nation well-suited for rebellion. But again, everyone and every time has its tipping point. The Chilean iceberg of neoliberal oppression is not only born from U.S. policy, it is U.S. domestic policy as well. And I do believe at some point soon our policy will open the floodgates of rebellion here at home, just as it has in our attempted colonies, from Chile to Iraq. The question is, will that rebellion be short-lived because it holds on to the American dream as a possibility, or worse, as a past that we can get back to? Or will we, as revolutionaries, embrace the messy and dangerous reality of unapologetically demanding freedom and justice, and in so doing embrace the possibility of winning, the possibility of failing, and the dignity, the responsibility of fighting? As philosopher Slavoj Žižek writes in the introduction to Sophie Wanich's book In Defense of the Terror, do we have the right to remain at a distance from state power when state power is itself disintegrating, turning into an obscene exercise of violence so as to mask its own impotence? And from this, we must, just as all people must, have the very serious conversation about what violence means and what defense means. Now, I've talked about this on the show, and I want to again make clear that violence is shooting people in the streets. Violence is withholding health care and pensions and letting people die in poverty and sickness. Violence is the largest military-industrial complex that the planet has, have, has ever seen. Violence is destroying ecosystems. Violence is the prison-industrial complex. It is colonialism. It is not defacing a statue or monument, as was done in Chile, for instance, to a commemorative plaza bearing the name of the dictator Pinochet. Violence is not hanging a decapitated statue head from the hands of an indigenous Mapuche statue. No, that is in fact just fucking awesome. Finally, violence is not defending yourself or your community. The oppressed always have a right to self-defense. It's important to make these distinctions because they not only frame the fight, they allow the fight to realistically take shape, take aim, and activate. So as we ask why the U.S. isn't rebelling, while we ask ourselves what we are willing to do and how we can do it, we have to again ask the question of how we are programmed to consider violence. As Mark Twain wrote, what is the horror of a swift death by the axe? compared with lifelong death from hunger, cold, insult, cruelty, and heartbreak. Or as Bertrand Brecht rather succinctly put it, what is the robbing of a bank compared to the founding of a new bank? These simple questions unmask the programmed passivity to state violence and the programmed distrust or fear of our own power. As Zizek challenges, instead of a simplistic rejection of violence and terror, one should thus first widen its scope. Learn to see violence where the hegemonic ideology teaches us to see none, and then analyze it in a concrete way, detecting the potential emancipatory use of what may at first appear to be purely reactionary militarism. And understand, I am not posing these ideas flippantly. I hate fighting. I'm afraid of getting hurt, of being thrown into a cage. I hate getting punched. I hate getting tear gassed and hearing concussion grenades go off right next to me. There is nothing fucking romantic about any of this. And more people on the left need to step back from this blind romanticization of violence. It's not helpful and only feeds into the same twisted ideologies of the state. When we look at our tactics, when we evaluate our future, we must acknowledge soberly and solemnly that not everyone, not every place, time, or people has the luxury to avoid fighting back. Louis must die, not so that the nation may live, but so that the people can live today. Across the globe, people are rattling thrones, and we are only alone so long as we hold on to our illusions. Before we move on to our revolutionary interview, I want to touch on some news from AFRICOM, or Africa Command, aka the U.S. imperialist colonialist scramble for Africa. 
And don't just take my word for that. Vice Admiral Robert Mueller told an AFRICOM conference in 2008 that AFRICOM's goal was protecting the free flow of natural resources from Africa to the global market. Furthermore, Mueller wrote in 2010, let there be no mistake, AFRICOM's job is to protect American lives and promote American interests. <laughs> And who says colonialism is just a blast from the past? Of course, as with any war on terror endeavor, I really fail to see how killing innocent civilians protects me or my interests. For instance, on Friday, October 25th, a U.S. drone strike killed frankincense collectors in Somalia's northeastern region of Puntland while supposedly aiming for an ISIS hideout. Soon thereafter, AFRICOM Commander Army General Stephen Townsend visited Somalia to, quote, meet with important African international and U.S. key leaders to visit our troops and to assess the progress of our campaign in East Africa and against Al-Shabaab. Hmm. I don't see any mention here of killing frankincense collectors or why he or the U.S. Army is so anti-frankincense. Granted, it's not my favorite scent either, but I have yet to kill anyone over it. Still, all joking aside, AFRICOM has fuck all to do with fighting terrorists. Because if it did, the only thing we'd be doing over there is punching ourselves in the face. The U.S. military is there, as we were in Chile, as we have been in Argentina, Colombia, Haiti, Brazil, Venezuela, and all over the world, to protect our empire and our imperialist profits. Now, here to talk more about imperialism, class warfare, AFRICOM, and revolution is Chairman Omali Yeshitela of the African People's Socialist Party. Take a look. One thing, the African People's Socialist Party is informed that politically by a uh, theory of African internationalism. It presupposes the existence of an African nation that uh, not only includes Africans who are on the continent of Africa, uh, and uh, constitute a part of a single nation, despite the fact that uh, in 1884 and 85, the Europeans in Berlin, Germany, uh, held a conference that uh, divided Africa into the existing entities that we see now that are often referred to uh, as countries and sometimes illogically as nations. But uh, And then that includes Africans uh, on the continent of Africa, Africans who were forcibly dispersed. It's not like uh, as is commonly said about uh, people in this country that it's supposed to be some kind of nation of immigrants. Africans are not immigrants. We were captives. And uh, the fact is that uh, in, in addition to the indigenous population here, we're the only people who did not come here looking for a better way of life but lost it. And so you have Africans who are here. You have Africans in places like Haiti, Jamaica, throughout the Americas, and Africans on the continent of Africa uh, who have been locked into uh, these uh, entities, these uh, state-like entities that uh, have imposed uh, on uh, African people uh, this uh, false national consciousness. So uh, we leave Africa and we disappear. We are no longer Africans when we leave Africa. Uh, we become Jamaicans and Haitians and and uh, all other kinds of things. And even on the continent of Africa itself, we uh, have these this distorted uh, concept of who we are, which other things uh, liquidates or uh, obscures uh, the potential for power because uh, now uh, we are maybe one million people or less in Djibouti, or we may be uh, one million people in Ecuador or Guinea or I've forgotten now how many they claim that Africans are in this country. We are these minorities in all these different places that we exist. <clears throat> so that works against us. So uh, we exist as a party, uh, not only in this country, uh, but we exist uh, in what they call the United Kingdom, although it's less united now uh, than ever. Uh, we uh, exist uh, uh, in, in France. Uh, we have organizational forces uh, uh, in uh in, uh, in Holland uh, and uh, in uh, Germany. Uh, and uh, we are also in, in, in the uh, Caribbean area, organization in terms of organizational presence. We are in what they call South Africa. <laughs> we are in Kenya. Uh, we are uh, in Nigeria. In fact, I'm speaking to an international conference in Nigeria at the end of next month. So 
We are in all of these places international. One, two, uh, we have uh, always worked toward and uh, struggled to uh, uh, have relationships with other colonizers and oppressed peoples around the world. We were first out of the gate when the uh, Nicaraguan Revolution uh, heated up uh, and uh, uh, in 1979. We held in uh, the California Bay Area, Northern California, the first uh, public uh, uh, meeting in support, solidarity uh, with the uh, Nicaraguan people and Nicaraguan Revolution. We uh, have worked closely since uh, at least the 1980s uh, with the Palestinian and uh, Iranian revolutionaries. This was even before uh, the uh, the Iranians succeeded in uh, overthrowing the puppet Shah of Iran. Uh, so, uh, and we've always worked toward having and fostering uh, these relationships. And we have probably the closest relationship possible uh, with the Mexican National Liberation Movement through our relationship uh, with Union de Barrio, uh, based uh, primarily, uh, well, based in Southern California, mostly. Uh, so we've always had these relationships, and we've always uh, recognized and attempted to uh, have this recognition represented in, in the organizational relationships, uh, the struggle of the indigenous peoples whose land uh, we sit on today, uh, despite uh, the fact that, uh, because of the fact that they are in these concentration camps, euphemistically referred to as Indian reservations. So we we have a deep uh, relationship and have always had a deep relationship uh, uh, with the indigenous people and with the many peoples around the world. And sometimes it's not only the people who would might be characterized as colonized people. Uh, it's also, uh, we recognize that sometimes we have the basis for relationships with other countries. And uh, uh, for example, uh, right now, while it is a lot, there's a lot being made of uh, uh, so-called Russian interference in elections, et cetera, and then everything that somebody says uh, about America on social media has is attributed to Russians or some other uh, force like that. I mean, we've attempted to establish a good relationship with uh, what we have characterized as uh, anti-imperialist forces uh, in Russia as well. So we've we've had these and continue to work and develop these relationships uh, uh, internationally, recognizing again uh, that the uh, critical uh, uh, factor in dealing with capitalism is uh, uh, certainly the uh, colonized uh, peoples uh, around the world. So would you, a lot of times there's this sort of argument going back and forth, like, oh, it's a, it's a class issue. No, it's a race issue. Would you say that the, it's, it's both, basically? Well, we don't think that. But race is a concoction that somebody, you know, came up to, uh, to justify this characterization of, uh, of uh, black people the way that happens today. We say that the class question in the real world is concentrated in the colonial question. And Karl Marx himself said many years ago that um, that uh, capitalism uh, came into existence uh, as a consequence of uh, of uh, turning Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins. In fact, he uh, talked about this being primitive accumulation. This is the startup of the entire thing. He said that uh, that uh, that slavery or uh, the enslavement of African people. Uh, had played the same role in, in political economy uh, or, or the equivalent of the same role in political economy as uh, original sin uh, in theology, that this is a starting point, this is the beginning. So we say that uh, the capitalist uh, system itself, he, he went so far as to say that uh, uh, that uh, slave, that uh, uh, wage slavery, as he characterized it, uh, in what was called the, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, required as a pedestal slavery pure and simple in the new world. Uh, so the whole capitalist edifice uh, rests upon a pedestal of uh, the oppression, the enslavement, and colonization of uh, Africa. Africans in particular, but not only Africans, played this fundamental role as the primitive accumulation. So uh, we say that the class question in the real world is, con is, is concentrated in the colonial question. And, and that is why uh, you uh, too often see that uh, people who characterize themselves as fighting uh, for the working class this and the working class that uh, always, find, always in every instance, find themselves doing it uh, at the expense of Africans, Mexicans, the indigenous peoples, etc. Uh, we are never on the agenda. 
uh, because the thing is flipped uh, 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 upside down. The reality is that as opposed to this, this ongoing search for how black people and indigenous people and Mexicans, et cetera, factor into the struggle for socialism, we say that uh, the road to socialism is painted black. And that uh, if we want to get to socialism, then white people, Europeans, not only here, but around the world, uh, need to uh, uh, unite uh, with the struggle uh, for the emancipation, liberation of the colonial subjects uh, here and in various other places. So really, you can't address the class issue until you address decolonization. When you address, the, we say, when you address decolonization, you are addressing the class issue. That, that's where it's concentrated. It's there. It's not some contest between uh, industrialized white workers and industrialized uh, uh, bosses. It's, it's the colonial question. Everything sits upon the pedestal of the oppression of the enslaved and colonized Africans and other peoples around the world. That's where, that's where it is. And I want to shift a little bit uh, to, to something that, that you mentioned at this event in New York uh, a while back, because uh, something that we've talked about on the show before is AFRICOM and this uh, continuation of the colonial imperialism and plundering of Africa. Uh, talk about uh, AFRICOM specifically and how your organization is combating it. I wanted to, I'm glad you mentioned AFRICOM for a number of reasons, because it's, it's, it's fundamentally uh, the sharpest immediate expression of the attack on Africa and, and maintaining the, the, the status quo, maintaining the uh, relationship that Africa has to, uh, to the imperial world. Uh, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned it also because uh, it, is, uh, uh, represent, it represents a, a crisis of sorts that the imperialists have been able to detect. The AFRICOM is there uh, in the name of, of uh, supporting uh, the existing African governments and training them uh, so that uh, terrorism will not prevail when starve Africans are starving on the continent of Africa. People work all day for a single meal on the continent of Africa. And the richest, the wealth of Africa, the wealthiest continent on the planet Earth in terms of natural resources are shipped out every day at our expense. And they are shipped out uh, uh, to the United States and they are shipped out to Europe. And increasingly, you see them shipped out to China uh, and other forces. In fact, China is the fastest growing uh, economy, economic force on the continent of Africa. And AFRICOM uh, becomes extremely important to maintain, to, uh, to protect the neo-colonial states that's there, to protect it, to maintain uh, these colonial borders, to maintain the puppets that they have in, in power, to protect them from the masses of African people, one. And two, uh, AFRICOM is also there uh, to protect U.S. interests, uh, from, uh, particularly from China, but from also other contending imperial powers. At one time, uh, the struggle between France and the United States for uh, resources on the continent of Africa uh, was such that uh, there, was a, there were actually wars uh, happening, proxy wars between France and the United States, uh, 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 because uh, there are certain sectors of Africa that have been long considered to be the uh, domain of, uh, of French imperialism, so-called Afri uh, uh, Francophone Africa. And the United States have been working to penetrate that for a number of years. And at one juncture, the struggle became so intense that uh, proxy wars uh, were everywhere. And proxy wars continue to happen in Africa even today, although uh, we don't see France and the United States uh, so much at each other's throat, but we do see uh, relationships uh, uh, increasingly between uh, United States and France and other uh, European imperial powers uh, to try to protect uh, what they see as their interest in Africa from China in particular, uh, et cetera. So that's that's part of how how we view this. And the way that AFRICOM is going to be dealt with is that uh, and other forces, we're going to have to fight uh, AFRICOM. We're going to have to fight uh, those troops on the ground on the continent of Africa. And that's, we're building revolutionary organization right now as we have this discussion in Africa. If you went to our, our website, then you saw uh, that there are actual uh, uh, party organizations. Uh, we have organized what we call the African Socialist International uh, that, uh, with the objective of uh, putting revolutionary forces down on every place where African people exist, and particularly on the continent of Africa. So we're building revolutionary organization on the ground. And we say this, we, we really, really feel good that people demonstrate and things like that against AFRICOM, uh, and that's right on. And we, we do that, we protest the existence of AFRICOM, but in the final analysis, 
Africacom is going to be defeated there on the ground militarily. It's going to be defeated politically and military right there on the continent of Africa. And that is something that people are going to have to learn how to do because it's not it's not enough just to go out yelling peace, peace, uh, because you can have an imperialist peace. You can have peace on the plantation. We have to say victory to the oppressed. We have to unite with those who have been victimized by U.S. imperialism, whether that's in Iran, whether that's in Venezuela or any other, but all on the continent of Africa. And that's what we see our primary role is, is organizing in Africa and among African people worldwide to be able to push Africa out. Now, I say worldwide. That's because there are Africans, of course, uh, throughout Europe, throughout uh, the United States as well. And we have to develop a capacity uh, to make the U.S. Uh, pay consequences for what it's doing in Africa, even if we are in New York or if we're in Florida and Texas or what have you. And that can mean any number of things. At one time, uh, in, uh, um, when uh, Shell and various other corporations like that were uh, in obviously involved uh, in exploiting resources on the continent of Africa. We initiated massive uh, boycott uh, campaigns of African people in this country to, against Shell uh, and had demonstrations and service stations and other places throughout this country against Shell to hurt, to make them have to pay consequences and to uh, withdraw uh, the kind of uh, practices that uh, they were engaged in there. And that's what we're going to have to have the ability to do here. And I'm just using that kind of thing as an example. But that's one of the the, the lesser uh, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> the lesser task <coughs> that I think we have before us. So I want to I want to touch briefly on on, some, on something that you mentioned uh, not just just now but also at the event in New York this concept of revolution and that although uncomfortable people have to recognize that the trajectory for winning justice and not just as you said a sort of like imperialist peace is revolution. Can you talk a little bit more about that uh, somewhat uncomfortable stance for many, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, because the, the truth is that uh, it's not enough to try to improve imperialism or to reform imperialism. A reformed imperialism continues to be imperialism. And imperialism represents a relationship that uh, we have. And uh, when you look at uh, what we're confronted with, you have this contest between the oppressed and the oppressors. Now, there's a whole uh, thing that characterizes racism that people talk about all the time uh, that does not recognize the existence of oppressed and oppressors or contending forces. Uh, racism, fighting against racism, uh, somehow has us trying to improve the system to get people to like us, to become, uh, you know, you know um, better adjusted to this thing. It does not. Uh, it does not uh, promote recognition of actual uh, contending social forces uh, of that kind of contradiction. When you talk about colonialism, you're talking about to recognize that people don't colonize themselves. If you're colonized, there must be a colonizer. If I'm oppressed, there must be an oppressor, and this has to be dealt with. So I'm not talking about reforming this relationship between the oppressor and the oppressors. I'm talking about severing that relationship between the oppressor and the oppressor. And African people worldwide, including African people who exist in the United States in this hemisphere, must achieve the ability of independent self-government, self-rule. And when I say independent, I mean without the intervention of neocolonial stooges, either in this country or other places, who serve imperialist power. And that is one of the things that really drives recognition of the relationship that we have to have with the indigenous people here in this country, with the Mexicans, because people are talking about Trump and a wall, as though that's the critical issue. And this is especially powerful with liberals and others. I mean, the question is, half of Mexico was stolen at gunpoint. When you look at Texas, California, uh, you know, and the rest of that. So uh, the Mexican people are natural allies. That wall is going to be meaningless when this revolution really unfolds. And we will see the relationship unfold between the Mexican and African revolutionaries uh, in this country, along with revolutionary forces around the world. And of course, the indigenous peoples uh, who don't even get mentioned unless they're in the room or somewhere, you know, uh, got some ceremonial role beating a drum before a peace march, you know, something to that effect. Yeah, very, very, very well put. Um, so, so finally, I wanted to kind of get the the the, the your commentary on the the structure of your work, the African People's Socialist Party. What, if anything, sets this apart from other groups like, for instance, Black Socialists of America, and and why socialism specifically? Well, uh, yeah, let me, I'm glad to raise that because people bandy about the term socialism a lot. 
today. I mean, Bernie Sanders is a socialist and because he believes in $15 an hour over a number of years and universal health care and nationalizing certain kinds of things that will be nationalized under the same social system with the same ruling class and and power. Uh, when, uh, socialism for us is not $15 over a number of years or social or, uh, or, or what do they call it, uh, uh, this uh, Medicare for all. Socialism is that the people who produce the value are the, uh, socially are the ones who collectively own and control that value. Uh, the, 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 the socialism occurs when the working class has, has, has seized political power and economic power and ownership of the means of control, a means of, of uh, production, which we may or may not uh, afterwards give Bernie a job for $15 an hour uh, over a number of years. I mean, uh, it's not some beneficent capitalism. Socialism, as we understand it, is a precursor to communism, classless society, uh, where there are not, uh, 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 there is not a situation of, uh, of uh, the labor of others being appropriated, uh, stolen uh, uh, for, to create uh, resources and values uh, for a handful of people who own and control everything. It means eliminating this uh, profound contradiction uh, between socialized production uh, and private ownership of that which is produced. That is absolutely taboo. So we're not talking about something like that. We're talking about the actual seizure of political power in the hands of the working people uh, here and in various other places around the world. In particular, that is important for us in terms of Africa and also, you know, uh, working out the, the details of how African uh, revolution uh, manifests itself here because I'm about in practice uh, uh, the struggle for self-government every day. Everything we do is uh, promoting self-government, being in control of our own affairs, our own life, our own uh, capacity to produce life uh, for ourselves. So uh, I don't know if I responded to what you just mentioned, but it's going to take revolution. We're going to have to seize power. We're talking about a contest between colonial capitalists and those who are uh, oppressed and exploited by colonial capitalism. And this struggle, uh, we suspect, has the ability uh, at some juncture in its development, uh, and even, uh, uh, even now we see manifestations of it, of uh, drawing uh, uh, white people uh, separating white people from their bourgeoisie and this a nonsensical, ridiculous concept of whiteness and white that uh, locks them uh, against uh, what should be their own interest. I say should be because there is a payoff for this, for being white. There is a payoff for that. Uh, and it is a pittance of uh, uh, that people uh, uh, acquire at a horrible price, not only to other peoples around the world, but also uh, to themselves, which is responsible, we believe, in part uh, to this spike in the death rate of white people uh, that uh, is extraordinarily unusual suicides, alcoholism, and this kind of stuff. Uh, the inability uh, to face uh, this changing world where it's clear uh, that uh, white power is on its deathbed as it exists today. That's what all these, un these unending wars, et cetera, is all about. So uh, anyway, that's part of what I would say about that. What do you feel the role is of, you know, for instance, poor white folks that are also uh, in inside of the system and have that relationship of oppressed to the oppressor? What do you feel the role is of, like, for instance, poor white folks in the United States? Well, the first thing you should do is turn Trump loose, turn loose Donald Trump. And I wasn't being exactly funny there. Uh, but I think that, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, increasingly, uh, I'm convinced that more and more white people, uh, depending on how Africans and other oppressed peoples around the world are moving and have to move or being forced to move, uh, will begin to discover their place and, and be able to uh, rid themselves of this horrible relationship they have to white power, the white ruling class itself. Uh, because people are always asking the question, well, why does it that see all these white people voting against their own interests and working against their own interests. You can only say it's against their own interests if you just look at white people <clears throat> by yourselves. But if you look at white people versus the rest of the world, it's not against your own interests. And this is the critical question. We're talking about the colonized versus the colonizer. And inside the colonial, the existence of the colonizer, then there are these contradictions that are very uh, that are not, not as pronounced as they would be if they didn't have this relationship with, with the oppressed and the colonized. So 
the, the white people, white workers, can see all the stuff that's happening with the Iranians, and they also understand that every victory of the Iranians uh, represents a setback for white power. And as long as they identify with white power, they see it as a setback for themselves. And this is not just a, a sociological or psychological thing. This is also something that results in, in, in actual material value, even for white, poor white workers, because there is such a thing as social wealth. And white people enjoy social wealth, despite the fact that there are some poor white people and Africans enjoy social poverty, despite the fact there are some rich black people. This is the reality that we're trapped with. And we are inviting white people to move forward. We created an organization called the African People's Solidarity Committee, white people who can unite under the leadership of the African Revolution to overturn this whole social system that's responsible for the oppression and exploitation of us all. And that's what we are about. We want to end the world. We're not looking for some kind of world uh, where, where African people get an opportunity to do to white people what white people have done to Africa. We want to end the existence of exploitation of oppression. All We have no stakes. The African working class has no stakes uh, in, in oppression and exploitation. We have to end it. And that's what we're about. And that means across the board. And that's what white people are going to have to learn to do. Even poor white workers in the whole damn thing. You cannot have your whiteness and socialism, too. You cannot have your whiteness and liberation, too, because it's your whiteness that's so connected uh, to the oppression and exploitation of everybody else. That's what we're telling white workers. And by the way, we are doing this. We are we engaged in an electoral campaign right now in St. Petersburg, Florida, with an African population of only 23 percent. And the, and, the, and the campaign that we're uh, waging is done under the slogan of uh, unity through reparations. We said the white people, the whites and Africans can unite under reparations and also make the South Side black again, which is an uh, anti-gentrification program. And, and we're having some success. I mean, we've had situations where we've had a couple of hundred white people marching down Central Avenue in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, white uh, uh, territory chanting unity through reparations. So it's possible. Uh, but we cannot make certain kind of concessions. We cannot make certain kinds of concessions to whiteness as a condition for establishing some kind of relationship. White people are going to have to move from that position. Uh, and, and this isolate, this is a, a kind of voluntary isolation that white people enjoy. Uh, from the rest of the world based on the fact that all the resources of the people of the world are located in some white community someplace in the world. We got to, and people are coming to take that back. And what white people have to do is release themselves from this relationship with imperialism and unite with the struggle to take it back, to take it all back. And that's, uh, that's, that's, I think that's the, the way forward. And that's the real integration that we can, you know, we can look forward to. For more on Chairman Yeshitela's work, visit APSPUhuru.org. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Reminder, the best way to stay up to date on our work is to sign up for the newsletter at the address below. To those who have donated, thank you so much. Please keep spreading the word in order to ensure our ability to keep acting out. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. <laughs>